Last week I, I spoke, um, you know, about this revelation knowledge that um, Peter had and Jesus saying that, that this is the foundation, right? This revelation that you have of who I am um, when he said, you're the Christ, you're Christ, you're my Messiah, you're the son of the living God. And, and Jesus told him, he said, he said, this is what I'm going to build my church on. That this knowing, this revelation of who he is. And toward the end, I, I shared just this, this moment of, of Jesus going where he was asked, or, or when somebody asked him or invited him, he went. And so I just wanted to start today and probably go on a little bit uh, from here and in, in just talking about places that when pe people invited Jesus to, to their house or, or even to the wedding that he went to. But this first one here is, is when Jesus went to Matthew's house. And Matthew, uh, Levi being a tax collector and, and sitting there taking taxes from his fellow Jews and, and being uh, really an outcast. I'm going to go more into that, but it, it just before this said that Jesus had come into his, his, his own town and healed a paralytic man and all of a sudden, like, well, not all of a sudden, but as it just went every single time that Jesus did something like this that the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they're, they're kind of up in arms and like, how, is he, how can he do this? What is he doing? Like, and it's just, they're all over it, right? Um, just watching him like a hawk to, to catch him in something or to say basically every time how he's doing something that they th think that he shouldn't do. And this isn't a different case. And it says that he just went on from there as after he healed the paralytic man, they were walking on. And in Matthew 9, 9, it starts and it says, as Jesus passed, as he passed on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. So he arose and followed him. Now it happened as Jesus sat at the table in the house that behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard that, he said to them, like, I don't know, you know, he, he knew what people were saying, even when, you know, they were out of, you know, maybe they were whispering it, or maybe they were just thinking it in their heart. But this even seems like they were just, they're talking to the disciples and saying it loud enough that Jesus just heard them, you know? It's like, I'm talking behind your back, but I'm not talking behind your back. I don't, I, I don't know why I get, it's like, ugh. And it says, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Verse 12, when Jesus heard that, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. All right. So we have this moment where, where Jesus comes and and here in verse 9, it says that he passed on from there, and, and he sees Matthew sitting in his tax office. He's there, little window, and, and collecting taxes from the people, and he passed by, and, and Jesus just says, follow me. And he did it. He just got up and, and rose up and, and followed him. And I just like, like yeah, yes. I, I don't know about you, but sometimes I pray like, God, just let me like have 
that kind of, you know, when you see this in different places in the Bible that, you know, that God speaks to you, that he says, hey, I want you to do this. Hey, follow me. Hey, don't do that. Hey, and, and, I'm, and I'm thinking, God, I, I want to have that mind, that heart, and be in that place and, and just listen. And, and when I hear you say, I do, immediately. And this is even a, a different kind of thing because this is a guy, of course, he's, uh, he's Jewish, Matthew, but he's not a part of one of the, the Jews that, that are practicing the Jewish religion, and he's really an outcast, and, and, and he comes to him, and this, you could imagine him sitting there being really probably ridiculed and hated by, by all of his people, and Jesus coming by and saying, follow me. This word, these words, follow me, it actually means to join one as a disciple or to follow as a disciple. And, and I love this. It even says that it's to side with one's party. And I was thinking about that, and I was like, God, he came by, Jesus came by, and when he said, follow me, he, he, he came by and he, and he said, he said, hey, Get up and be one of my disciples and, and, and stop siding with those things that you have been siding with. To get away from the, the side that you picked and come over to my side. Come over where I am and, and join me and be my disciple. I don't know about you. I, hmm, that hits me because I feel like sometimes, even myself, I feel like, man, God, did I, just, did I side with something else, with my own feelings? Did I side with my own opinion? Did I side with, with somebody else's opinion? Or did I side with you? Because that's what being a disciple is. Saying, ah, no matter what I think or how I feel, if it doesn't line up with how you feel and how you think, I'm not going to go over there. So Jesus just says, just walks by and he's like, follow me. He gets up and, and he goes. A little more backstory is that tax collectors were, were notorious sinners and cheats, swindlers. They, they really, most of the time, were, were not good. And really, as I was studying, reading, there was, they said like they put up a statue of this one because there was this one that was really actually a good, true, honest tax collector. And it was like so rare that they're like, we, we should probably just build a like memorial. Here's the one honest tax collector, you know? And, and, but every single other one, it, it was like they were just cheats. They were stealing. And really what happened was is that the Roman government would, would have them collect taxes, and what they would do, it, it was they could keep anything that was extra. So they're really trying, they're, these tax collectors, being a Jew, with their own people, are pushing and, and swindling and trying to get more and more than even is needed from the for the Roman government so because they get to keep the rest so you can imagine right you can imagine how the people felt about them it says when a jew became a tax collector that that they were considered an outcast it says they were disqualified as a judge or a witness in a court session in the Jewish court, they were excommunicated from the synagogue and in the eyes of the community. And they were a disgrace that even extended to their, their family, not just them. This is how they were regarded. Disqualified. And Jesus walks by and he says, follow me. Actually, just get up. 
from that place that you've sided with and come over here where I am and be my disciple. See, because Jesus said, no matter what has disqualified you, no matter, no matter how you have disqualified yourself or no matter how somebody else has disqualified you, I've come to qualify. I've come to be that qualification for you. So while all that stuff really doesn't even matter because if you come with me and you follow me, you will be qualified. So it gets up. Matthew just hops up. And I don't, I don't know, like, you know, he's got like Roman soldiers with him that help him enforce this collecting of taxes that are there, you know, to make sure people do it. And, and I, he just hops up out of his chair. He's like, okay. You know, and I even read it's like in, that, that like this is something that, that while <laughs> he may have been more disqualified by people or di- uh, felt as a disgrace or an outcast, but this actually probably was a, a harder decision than even some of the other disciples because it would have been way easier to go back to fishing or one of those other jobs than it would be to go back to that office of tax collection. But he gets up, and he just walks. But I love, you know, to think about this. Like, <laughs> you know where Jesus tells them, he says, I, have, I don't want you to catch these regular fish anymore. I want you to be fishers of men. And he, he uses that. He says, you've been bringing in and, and collecting this fish for food, but I want you to, to, to bring into my house and, and to my family people. I want you to be fishers of men. And, but when you see Matthew, it's, it's so amazing because I, I was thinking about this and, I, and he used to write down what was being taken from the people. But God changed that. He changed that to something where Matthew could be remembered for writing down then, forever after he was remembered for writing down now here, in this very book, what was being given to the people. He changed. He changed his his pen if you will. God redeemed it. That thing that once disqualified him and Christ qualified it and used it. Not not just right then, but for you, like right now. That that guy sitting in that office, that tax collection office that everybody hated and was an outcast and a disgrace and and, and everybody hated his pen because he used it to write down how much was taken from them that now we get to right now be able to read the words that he wrote down that say what was given to us and how we've been saved, how we've been redeemed. That's qualification right there. That, that's re-qualification. He says, your stuff, your mess, that thing that was once hated, I'm going to take it and use it for good. Hmm. Not only that. You know, as I'm reading a study, it says, it says that there's evidence that that there was even taxes placed on fish that were caught by these fishermen. And imagine this. Imagine this. Jesus is walking down the road, and he's coming through, and he's already got some of the guys following him, you know. And, you know, he had, he had called them out of their fisher, their, their boat from fishing 
you know, and they're walking with him, and, and, and he's like, follow me, Matthew, and these guys are like, wait a second, our whole lives, this guy is, like, we've been trying to catch fish, and he's just taxing us for all the fish we catch. There's a conflict of interest here. There's something wrong with this. And I was thinking about that. Like, I mean, what? Is there anybody that if they walk through the doors, that it would get us a little hot and bothered? It would be like, wait a second, you don't understand what they've done or who they are. Right? Because this knowing Christ, this revelation that we have, it should confront us, who we are, maybe what we felt or thought about others, or maybe how we feel like we need to be or others need to be qualified when Christ is saying, no, I'm the one that does that. Imagine the introductions. It's Peter, John, it's Matthew. <laughs> we know him. But look how in this place of relationship with God, how they worked together and did what God had asked them to do. To, to be there at the birth of the church. To be there in that moment when, when God changes everything to set up his church. <laughs> in Matthew 9, in 10, it says, now it happened, 9.10, it says, now it happened as Jesus sat at the table. In the New Living Translation, it says, Matthew invited Jesus and his di disciples to dinner. It says, now it happened as Jesus sat at the table at Matthew's house. And behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. Many, so all of a sudden, Matthew said, follow me. Come with me. Be my disciple. And you have this moment. It doesn't exactly say it here, but we can gather that, that all of a sudden, Matthew invites. He's like, I, something's happened. You've invited me to walk with you to be your disciple, and I, I want to invite you into my house. Are we inviting him into our house, into our place, into our spaces and our stuff, you know? And, and, and Jesus is like, yeah, of course. Of course I'll go to your house. And so Jesus goes and he's sitting there and then it says that many, many tax collectors and sinners came. Those guys that were swindlers and sinners and outcasts and and all these people come in to sit with Jesus. In verse 11, Matthew 9, 11, the Pharisees, it says, when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Now, the simple answer is, it because, is it's because Jesus is a friend of sinners. The simple answer is that because God loved us so much that while we were still sinners, he sent his son to die on the cross for us. And I don't know about you, but I'm so glad about that. Because sometimes we may forget, but we all are sinners in need of a Savior. We all need him. We all. See, these religious leaders that were there, they said, no, they're disqualified. No, these people, they haven't done all the things. 
These religious leaders, and I would say sometimes we in the church still, they're like doctors and that, that don't want to go around sick people. It's like telling my kids they're so, so dirty and saying, don't come in the house, don't go take a shower because you're so dirty. No, you need to take a shower because you're so dirty. No, you need a doctor because you're so sick. were trying to disqualify him. Look what they've done. Look how they've sinned. And Jesus said, no, I didn't come like you to disqualify people or say why they can't be in relationship with me. I've come to qualify and say that I am the reason that they can be in relationship with me. In Romans 5, 8, that God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, that Christ died for us. While we were still a mess, while we were still, or if we are still, still in that place, that while we're still even in that place of, of sin or shame, like that, that being, siding with the sin, siding with the place that, that we have stayed because we, we didn't think we needed God. And Christ says, hey, follow me. Be my disciple. We come to this moment now where Christ hears this. He's, Jesus is sitting there and they say to the disciples, why is he sitting there eating with tax collectors and sinners, and apparently saying it so loud that he could actually hear. And, and he heard this, and he said, verse 12, when Jesus heard that, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Those who are well don't need to go to the doctor. But when you're sick, you need a doctor. You need somebody to help you. Somebody to tell you what's needed so you can get better. He says, but go and, and learn what this means. Go and learn what this means. So first of all, let me just, I love that Jesus, he's sitting here with you. these religious leaders, high and mighty guys that had been ruling, you know, the religious realm in that day, and they are coming to, really to disqualify Jesus, to disqualify him, to tell him what he's doing wrong. And, and I love that, that he comes to this place where they say, why is he doing this? And he says, listen, the sick are the ones that need a doctor. And what I'm gonna say to you is go and learn what this means. Like, he set them in their place. He said, boy, what he said? You guys think that you know so much about Scripture. Look, you're, oh, you're, yeah, you're the Pharisees. You do all this stuff and feel so high and mighty. Like, you got everything together, and you can just do it all exactly right, you know, because you got up and you cleaned the right way and you washed your hands so many times and you prayed so many times and did all these things and you guys feel all so good. And he says, but go and learn. This scripture that you think that you know so much about, he says, I'm telling you that you actually don't know what it means. That is some strong language. I feel like we need to hear even today that in the church in general, the scripture that you think that you know so much about, you need to go back and reread and actually learn what it means. Instead of saying, I can quote the scripture, let's say that I know God and he's revealing to me what I need to know out of the scripture. It says, but go and learn what this means. I desire mercy 
and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. He's, he's giving this, this, <laughs> this picture of those that, that are well, not needing. And, and, and I take that even, and as you study this, I feel like there's even meaning in, in this when he says, those that are well. And I think it also means sometimes that, yes, those that are well, they, they don't need as much the doctor, the savior, the, you know, Christ to come in these big moments because we can get, even, even me, I'm like, what, God, why are you? <gasps> Look at that, the person, they have been, They've only known you for like two months and it's like all the stuff you're doing. They need him more. Not necessarily the fact that, it's not, it's not that he's there more, but they might need a little bit more of the, the medicine. They might need a little bit more of the love. They might need a little bit more to see who God is. And, and maybe he's not doing that big miraculous thing in my life right now, but can we be? In a place where we say, God, that person needs you. But in this, but in this, it's it's saying, look, you guys, the problem is you guys think you're well. You, you guys think that that you're not sick. So when you're in a place where you're like, I don't, I don't need anything, I'm I'm well. Why would I need a doctor? Why would I need him? He says there's though there are there are those that that are in need. Those that like the Pharisees being prideful and arrogant and thinking they're all that. I mean, that's really why they're like they wanted the Messiah to come. They wanted all that was spoken in Scripture to happen. The problem was that they were too prideful and high and mighty to really want it whenever it came. So he says, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. And Christ actually twice, he, he quotes this scripture from Hosea, Hosea 6. And in 4, 5, and 6, you see this place where, that where Israel is a mess. And it, and it speaks in 4, uh, in 5, it's, it says that Israel is in this place where Right, they which they got. It's like, like, can't you just stay up there instead of doing this and this? You know, it's like we're doing good. God did something with for us, and then all of a sudden it's like we're we're okay. We don't need you, God, and then we're prideful. And so they're in this place here in Hosea where where it says that, oh, you're doing the sacrifice. You're doing the ritual, the thing that maybe I have asked you to do. But you're angry. You're mad. You're envious. You're, you're killing your, each other. You're doing all this stuff, and you're saying like, but look, I went to church. That's, that's, that's where they were in Hosea. It's like, look, look at this. We did this sacrifice to God. And and we did this, and we did all the stuff that we believe we're supposed to do. And he said, but you don't actually know me. You're just doing the things that you think you need to do. <sighs> so God comes, speaks. In Hosea 6.6, 6, it says this, for I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Jesus quoted this scripture to them. And, and I think he, he's like, he, giving them this like, 
okay, what does this mean? How do I, and I, I think he said it probably in a way that were there, they were confused and had to actually go back and reread it and learn and understand. He says, for I desire mercy and not sacrifice because the religious leaders of his day came. What were they doing? They were going through the motions. They said, we, knew, we know the scripture. Oh, we memorized the scripture, and I can quote it to you. And I, and I did all the things to make sure I was so clean and, and all this stuff, and, and I don't do this, and I do that, and I don't. And Jesus says, what, what I desire actually is your heart, not not the stuff you can do. A desire of mercy, what does that mean? The, it's, it's kindness, love, patience. A desire of who you are to be more like me as you come to know me, not just you doing Things. So we get that wrong sometimes. We think that, you know, the doing things brings us to this place. And that's how we're in a right relationship with God. But God said, no, my relationship that I have with you brings you to a place that makes you to want to do things right. It would cause you to want to act right, speak right, deal with issues right because of who I am in my relationship with you. I hear this second line in this scripture, Hosea 6, for I desire mercy and not sacrifice and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. See, they brought, here in Hosea, they brought sacrifices, but they never brought themselves to God. Going back to that revelation I spoke about last week, the revelation knowledge of who he is and to know him being the foundation of the church. And in this moment when he's, speaking to them, he's saying that same exact thing. So I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Desire your heart, who you are, to be more like me, more than just going through ritualistic things. And not only that, that scripture goes on to say, and the knowledge of God, to, and to know him, more than those sacrifices. Saying knowing me is the very most important part of everything that you do. They had missed what God wants, what the reason that Christ came, the reason he was there, what he wants the most a deep, close relationship with him. And this showed that they actually didn't know him. <laughs> and in this, and I, and I believe as we go the next couple of weeks and are studying these places where when Christ was invited, he went. I believe there's some key things that happen in those moments that tell us exactly what we need to have the relationship with, with him that we need to have. It's healing, knowing that revelation of knowing who he is some different things like that. But in this, I, want, I, I hope that 
what we get is that, and, and I do this, even myself, it's like it's this, this qualification thing. But the overarching picture of, of this moment where he went into the house of Matthew What that speaks is that no matter who you are, no matter what you've done or where you've been or how you grew up, no matter what, if we invite him in, if we if we ask him to come into this house, if we invite him in, he will come. And no matter what disqualification that I or you, we could have spoken over ourselves, no matter what disqualification that somebody else could have spoken over us, it makes no difference if we invite him in, he will come. I need that. We need that. We need to understand. We need to know. Please stand with me.